Last week, we began a sermon series, three-week sermon series, in which we're talking about the mission of our church. And last week, I did something uh, unique, at least, I haven't done them recently. I had you stand to recite something together, and repetition is our friend. I'm going to have you do that again today, if you'd all stand. We're going to repeat the mission of the church. I know James warmed you up for that, but I know there's probably a number of you that, well, without the words in front of you, that might be a little bit of a difficult task. So I'm wanting to cement this in with us so that we're all able to remember this, and the best way to do that is to read that together. All right, here we go. One, two, three. CCF makes maturing disciples of Jesus who live in Christian community and bring the hope of the gospel to the world. All right, you may be seated. We'll come back and do that one more time again next week, and I hope over time that this is going to make its way in. You'll notice the very first phrase there is what we talked about last week, making maturing disciples. And last week, I spoke to you about the environment. What is the best environment to create in order to have a disciple-making environment? This week, I want to talk about that second phrase, which is living in Christian community. That's going to be our topic for the day. I'm going to start off in a rather uh, maybe uh, uh, odd spot. I want to talk to you this morning about one of the most closely guarded business secrets in all of the world. It's the formula for Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola was developed in 1988 by inventor John Pemberton. Some of you know that cocaine was actually in the original Coca-Cola formula. And it stayed in the formula, I found this rather interesting, until 1903. It kind of makes me even wonder, like, where did the name Coca-Cola even come from? I mean, you know, hey, there's a little bit of a correspondence there. Coca-Cola has guarded the secret around their formula for making Coke. And in fact, I've got a picture here of the spot where the handwritten notes are. It's in the Coca-Cola library or museum uh, at the headquarters in Atlanta, and the handwritten notes of their formula are in that vault, and I don't think it's open very often, actually. There are two people in the entire company at any given time that know the formula for Coca-Cola, and those two can never travel on the same plane together. I wondered, how do they kind of guard this? And I found out some very interesting things about how they do. Did you know that the, the ingredients that make Coke are sent by mail or truck to the distributor, and they're in boxes labeled one to nine? And the distributor then mixes that formula with water and carbonation in order to make Coca-Cola. And so even the distributor only receives the, the raw components, but never really knows what's in those components. And so again, this guarded secret of the formula is, is kept safe. And in fact, all over the world, Coke is bottled, but nobody quite knows exactly what is in it. I hope you can know the point I'm trying to make here. You have to have the right ingredients in the formula to make Coke. And if you don't have those right formulas, then you don't have Coke. Because there's an essence to Coke. And some of you are saying, well, I really don't even care about that. I don't drink Coca-Cola. I don't drink any soft drinks. I get it. That's okay. But here's what I want you to hear. If you don't have the right ingredients, you don't have Coca-Cola. There is an essential quality to Christian community. There's qualities that we can experience together to live in Christian community, and that's what I want to talk about today. And the good news is it's not a trade secret. The good news is nobody's trying to hide that. God's not trying to hide that from you. He's trying to make sure you understand what is made up of Christian community, true Christian community, and that's what he wants you to lean into and what he wants you to practice, and that's what we're going to talk about today. What is the essence? What are the essential qualities of living in Christian community. It might help us to start today with actually what do we mean when we say Christian community. And one word is behind the word community in the New Testament. That word is koinonia. I've said this word before. You've repeated it with me before. Let's do it one time together. Koinonia, ready? One, two, three. Koinonia. And I've got a little something on the screen behind me about koinonia. Anytime you see in your English Bibles the word fellowship, association, community, or participation, chances are good that the word behind it is koinonia. 
That's the Greek word, and it's translated in those four different ways in your Bible. So if we're talking about biblical community, we're talking about this word underneath that means koinonia, or the, the word is koinonia, and it means something we share together. So it could mean that we are sharing something with each other. We're giving some valuable uh, asset or item to each other. That could mean one side of koinonia. The other side is I'm sharing me, my presence with you, and that's the aspect of koinonia or community. Let me give you a couple of examples. You bring a meal to somebody who's just come out of the hospital. That's koinonia. You've shared a meal with them, some love with them, and that is obviously helpful to them. There's also koinonia, and somebody has suffered some loss, and you simply go to be in their presence. What is it that you're giving them? You're giving them you, your sympathy, your compassion, your love. That is koinonia. Perhaps you uh, have coffee with somebody that you're in a discipleship relationship with. Maybe they're discipling you or you're discipling them. You're sharing that moment. You're sharing experiences. You're praying together. That is koinonia. When we come together to worship and pray together, that is community or koinonia. So the point is we have to share something together. That is the aspect of what it really means to live in Christian community And again, there are several, uh, seven uh, qualities of that that I want to talk about today, that idea of sharing in this life together, seven essential qualities, uh, and my hope is that it will help you appreciate what real biblical community is and help you notice a cheap substitute or a superficial aspect that won't really bring the kind of life that God wants for us. That's what my goal is. As soon as today's over, I'm hoping you're able to say, wow, those are seven things that make up real community, and I want that. And I want that more than I do, uh, a a version of that that maybe is in my mind or in the culture that's not really biblical community at all. So let's dive into these and see if we can make some headway. All right, the first one uh, that's the essential quality of biblical community is frequency. Frequency. Acts 2 verse 42 says this, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. In other words, they devoted themselves to each other and they spent a significant amount of time in each other's lives. This was not a once in a while thing. They were frequently in each other's homes. They were praying together, having meals together, learning together. And we can't try to convince ourselves that uh, you know, a once in a while trip to church is going to produce the kind of community or biblical community that we want. In fact, it won't even really produce the kind of growth that we're looking for and we want. It's going to take some deep time with a specific group of people or, and frequently with those people in order to grow into Christian community. Now, in a group this size, here's what I'm not saying. I am not saying that you have to have significant, frequent relationship with everybody in this room. That would be an impossibility. But I'm hoping that you have frequent and intimate conversation and and connection with some people in this room. In fact, that's needed. It's needed for your health, and it's needed for the health of Christian community in our church. And so frequency, together with a group of people, really getting to know that group of people at a deep level, that is needed, and that's one of the essential qualities of Christian community. The next one is a little bit of an odd word, but I'm calling it mutuality. And by mutuality, I mean interaction or a give and take with each other. Uh, Romans chapter 14, verse 19 says it well. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. It's what happens when we learn how to work together. It's the deep inside of us notion that I really do need you. I'm not an island by myself. Something happens together that wouldn't happen if we weren't together. And so I need you in order for me to grow spiritually and you need me. There's all kinds of examples of this mutuality that's happening in our church, even right now. Let me give you a couple of examples. One of them is this worship service. There needs to be a mutuality. There has to be a working together. And so there's individuals on the stage that are singing for us and they're leading us in in singing. They're playing instruments. There's some groups that are at the tech table right now that are helping to make sure you can hear me well. And they're recording this for individuals that can't be with us at another time. You are greeted at the door with individuals. If there's times in which we receive communion, there's groups that have gotten together and made those communion elements for it or, or prepared those. 
And so there's this mutuality of what it takes in order to come together and be God's people together. That's one expression of it. Let me give you another one. Right now across the street, there was a buzz this morning because the children's musical is underway for another year. And so there was all these children over there and they were together and they were getting ready to rehearse and, and practice. I've, I've heard that this week is the week in which uh, parts are beginning to kind of come around and like who's going to play what part in the play. And some kids are going to have speaking parts and some kids are going to have singing parts. Some kids are going to have dancing parts and there's choreographers and there's, there's individuals that are making costumes for the kids and all of that is all happening together in this beautiful mutuality. And we could not have that unless we had this idea of working together. I have got a good example of mutuality that I experienced this week. I was the very fortunate guy that got to be the guest of the Johnson family as I went to the Seahawk opener on Monday. And what a game it was, what a win it was. Here is me with the Johnson family Here's Rhonda and Jared and, and Asher, and we had a great time. Here we are at Lumen Field getting ready to go in, and we enjoyed the game. Could it have ended any better? It was awesome. And so again, wah, wah, sorry, Russell, but hey, it, 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 it all worked, right? But my excitement for the game did not end at the close of the game. It continued on. We ended up parking. I, ended, I bought the parking for us, and I really didn't know where we were going to park because I didn't know the downtown that well. But I ended up buying parking in a large multi-story parking structure at Columbia and First. And if you know anything about Seattle, not the best part of town, all right? But we were all, you know, fairly safe because there was just so many people that were going to the game. So we were part of a big mob. And we ended up coming back out of the game, and we ended entered the ninth floor where we had parked the car. You can kind of see what's going to happen here. And we pull out to get out of the parking structure and we moved about five feet and stopped. And we sat and we sat. And I said, you know, I've got to go explore. And I got out of the car and I left and I went down to the eighth floor. And you know what was happening on the eighth floor? That line of traffic was there and all these cars were backing out on the eighth floor to get in line. Down to the seventh floor, same thing. There's a line, but all the cars are backing out and getting in line. And it just went all the way down to the bottom that I said, we're never gonna move because these more cars are coming in all the time. And then I found the real problem at the basement near the exit. And here was the real problem. The cars came down, they split into two little lanes to go through the toll booth, and then they came out to get onto the street, but there were still all these pedestrians walking across the street. And so no cars could ever get out of the parking structure. I told Denise this story and she said, I think I know what's coming next. And I said, yeah, probably you do, probably do. I said, this needs some direction right now. <laughs> so I said to the people right there, would you mind stopping? We're gonna let a few cars go by. And I looked at the car and I said, your turn, come on. Your turn, come on. And they started moving out. I mean, baby, we were going. And I stop here, the pedestrians come on across. I ended up having a little cheering section of these two ladies. I think they were street ladies, actually. And they stopped and they were cheering me on. The manager of the parking structure comes out. And he comes to stand beside me. And I'm like, ooh, what's going to happen now? The gals yell out to him, you need to give that guy a raise. <laughs> it was awesome. I had this one guy roll down his window, comes out, fastest time I've ever gotten out of this parking structure. Thank you. Another gal passes by. She says, may your karma increase. You know, so I just had all this fun interaction. Rhonda texts me and says, where are you? I said, directing traffic. She said, of course you are. She comes down and, you know, it's my time, time to leave. So I run off to get into the car and the two ladies that are standing on the side of the street say, you can't leave, there's still cars here. So it was just, it was a magical moment. I mean, it was just, I, I found my second career if I ever need it. I'm, I'm good at directing traffic. I'm back to the point here. Mutuality. 
Somehow we needed each other. And we needed to participate with each other. And when we did that, things worked better. They worked so that we all benefited from that moment. And it was a kind of a magical moment. But my point in saying that is we need each other. And when we're mutually working together, then church life is better. And the sense of real community is felt at a very deep level. All right. The third essential quality of biblical community is humility. 1 Peter 5, verse 5. Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because, well, God opposes the proud but gives favor to the humble. Humility means that I don't think too highly of myself. It means that I actually know that I'm uh, fallible and that I'm willing to acknowledge when I have made a mistake. I've talked about this before, so maybe you'll recognize this, but there's one person that always comes to mind when I start thinking about humility or its opposite, which is pride. So if you're not a humble person, you're a proud person. And the person that always comes to my mind is the 50s Happy Days uh, star of the show, Fonzie, or to get the right name, Arthur Fonzarelli. And I've got a picture here of Fonzie, if you remember from Happy Days. And I, yay, that's right, yay. If you remember from the story, Fonzie was the cool kid. And, you know, he, he, he was heads and shoulders above everybody else, and he was cool. And Fonzie never, reportedly in his own mind, made a mistake. And if he ever made a mistake, then he would actually have difficulty actually saying the words, I made a mistake. He would say, I made a muh, 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 and he couldn't say it because he couldn't acknowledge to himself that he had made a mistake. Fonzie was never humble. Fonzie imagined himself to never make mistakes, and so he never needed to confess anything that was wrong, and you can't build Christian community among a bunch of proud people because proud people, well, they will never need each other. I guess there's a big question for all of us. When was the last time you confessed something you did wrong? When was the last time that you confessed something you did wrong? You know, that's a good thing to do. And I I don't mean just with God. I'm hoping that that's happening there regularly. But I mean with somebody else in which you need to come to the space of saying, I've done something and I've hurt you. In fact, that leads us to the fourth aspect of Christian community, which is forgiveness. And it's actually very difficult for people who are prideful to forgive anybody because really they don't feel like, you know, (laughs) they need to forgive anybody because they haven't committed any wrongs themselves. And so they have a lot of difficulty in doing that. Colossians 3.13, forgive one another. If any of you is a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Here's the deal. When we get into a sense of Christian community with each other, we are going to step on each other's toes. We are going to say things in which we regret. We're going to do things in which we say, I wish I could have a take back on that one. That's what it means to live in close contact with each other is that we're going to make those kinds of mistakes. And if we have a level of humility, as I talked about earlier, we come to the spot of being able to forgive more easily And there are times in which you've experienced that magical moment in which you know that you've done something wrong. You've come to somebody and you've said, I need to talk to you because I know that what I said hurt you. I I know that was painful. And I I, I don't want to repeat that. In fact, what I want to do is tell you right now how sorry I am and ask for your forgiveness and to have that person say to you, I forgive you. I mean, there's just something that transpires in that moment. It's a divine moment. And in fact, we, I think, short-circuit that too many times in which somebody says, you know, I'm sorry for such and such. And, uh, you know, you say, oh, hey, no big deal. And it ends right there. And the words are never shared. Would you forgive me? And the other person says, yes, I forgive you. And the transaction is never complete. And so, again, we short-circuit this idea of really what it means to offer forgiveness to one another. Let me remind you again what forgiveness means. It means to to remove a debt. It means to take a debt and remove that debt so it's no longer owed. And this is what's common in all of our lives. We love to savor when somebody else has done something wrong to us. We roll it over again and again in our minds and we replay it and we think how bad that was and we may even tell some other friends about how bad that was. And we just keep on mulling that over in our minds. To forgive the debt, to remove the debt means 
I'm no longer gonna hold that against you and I'm gonna instead deliver this to God who is the righteous judge. He's able to completely handle this and I'm going to now get that off of my ledger sheet. That's no longer something I'm gonna hold against you and that's what it means to forgive and that is a spot of tremendous freedom for all of us. It is an essential lubricant for Christian community, forgiveness. And for a true Christian community cannot exist if we are in a spot of unforgiveness towards each other. And so that has to be at the very base of what we're doing. The fifth essential quality of biblical community is sacrifice. To sacrifice means that I'm giving up something of value to somebody else. It could be financial. It could be time. Uh, you're taking something of value and you're giving it to another individual. Mark 10, verse 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so again, anytime we are sacrificing, we are doing something on behalf of another individual and we're giving something of value to them. I have this great story of a mother of a nine-year-old boy named Mark. She received a phone call in the middle of the afternoon. It was from the teacher from her son's school. Mrs. Smith, something unusual happened today in your son's third grade class. Your son did something that surprised so much, many of us that I thought you would want to know about it immediately. The mother began to get worried. The teacher continued, nothing like this has ever happened in all my years of teaching. This morning I was teaching a lesson on creative writing. And as I always do, I tell the story of the ant and the grasshopper. The story goes like this. The ant works hard all summer and saves, uh, stores up plenty of food, but the grasshopper plays all summer and does not work. Then winter comes and the grasshopper begins to starve because he has no food. So he begins to beg, please, Mr. Ant, you have so much food, please let me eat too. Then I said, boys and girls, your job is to write the end of the story. Mark's hand shot up and he said, teacher, can I draw a picture? And she said, well, yes, Mark, you may draw a picture, but first you must write the end of the story. As in all the past years, most of the students at this creative writing juncture, uh, they all write something like this. They write something like um, the grasshopper shared, or the ant shared with the grasshopper and both lived. A few students wrote, no, Mr. Grasshopper, you should have worked in the summer. Now I have just enough food for myself. So the ant lived and the grasshopper died. But your son, she said, ended the story very differently in a way I have never heard before. Here's the way he ended the story. So the ant gave all of his food to the grasshopper. The grasshopper lived through the winter, but the ant died. And at the bottom of Mark's paper, he drew three crosses. I'm not sure I saw that coming. And that's the nature of a savior that we have that's willing to sacrifice at that level for all of us. And he's telling us when there is a true level of community, there is a true level of sacrifice. And who wouldn't want to be a part of a community that operated like that? <laughs> Never easy, right? I mean, it's not easy to act like that. It's not easy to give that kind of time or that kind of resource to one another. But that's what God is saying is he is like, that's his character and what he's saying that he wants for us. The sixth essential quality of biblical community is unity. Ephesians 4, verse 3, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit of the bond of peace. Ten times in the book of Acts, it talks about this kind of unity. It says they were in one accord. They were unified. They were all together. They were with one heart. They were with one spirit. One, there was oneness around this initial uh, church that was being formed. And unity means that I share the same desire with you about the purposes of God. Unity doesn't mean uniformity. In other words, we're not all alike. 
Uh, we all get that. There's significant differences between all of us. We have different backgrounds. We have different educations, different financial means, different losses. We have different uh, things that have happened to us in our lives, different upbringings. All of those things are happening with us. But unity means that we're taking all those differences and we're somehow unifying them at the cross of Christ. There is a writer who is a part of uh, NPR, and her name is Heather King, and you, you might recognize right away from uh, NPR that she is a little liberal-leaning. And she is a recovering alcoholic that found Jesus and made her way into church for the very, very first time. And this is what she wrote. She says, my first impulse was to think, my God, I don't want to be a part of gaining soberness with these nutcases. Nothing shatters our egos like worshiping with people that we did not handpick. The humiliation of discovering that we are thrown in with an extreme, extremely uncompromising people. People who are broken, misguided, wishy-washy, out for themselves. People who are honestly us, she says. But we don't come to church to be with people who are like us. Oh, on the contrary, we come because we believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And we believe, she says, that somehow being a part of a group like that, a group that's so different from us, a group that honestly sometimes is even difficult for us to be with, that's the very place where we are living out what all of this means to live a life of faith before Jesus. And so again, even within all of our differences, we massively need each other. There's one more. Let me just hit it real quickly. The seventh essential quality of biblical community is faith. Jude 1.20 says, But you, dear friends, build up yourselves in the most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. And so again, unlike any other form of community, the difference in the community that we're creating is we're around one person, Jesus. You may say, well, I've got community in my neighborhood. I've got community at my workplace. Well, probably not, not biblical community anyway, because it's not centered around Jesus. And we need faith in Jesus. We need faith in all that he is talking to us about. We need faith that comes with the power that comes with that in order to hang together and live in Christian community. That's just a fact. It has to be a power source bigger than us in order for us to be able to accomplish what God is calling us to. All right. There's the seven essential qualities of Christian community, and I'm hoping that that's stirring you for this fall. I can think of no better way for you to pursue Christian community than to get into a smaller group. Maybe it is the women's Bible study this year. Maybe it is a youth group. Maybe it is, again, the play that's across the street that the kids are being a part of. Maybe it is uh, the discipleship class for men. Maybe it's a discipleship group where you're together with two or three others and you're living out life together. Maybe it's a community group that we just heard about earlier today. 12 to 15 people usually that are getting together semi-regularly, having food together, sharing each other's lives, sometimes studying some scriptures together and praying together. And that kind of weekly or regular interaction with each other, that's the kind of thing that spawns Christian community and begins to mature into something that really is a good thing. Christian community has some essential qualities and fortunately, there are qualities that you can feel and you can experience. They're not hidden away. God is not trying to keep that a secret in any way. He's saying, yes, I want you to come in. I want you to experience this because this is good for you and it's good for my church. So friends, I'm hoping that we can continue to build Christian community together this year. And here's what I'm here to tell you. That's not easy, but it is significant and it's meaningful. Will you wade into the tough stuff of creating Christian community with us this year? I invite you into that. Father, we thank you that you never ask us to do anything that you've not done first. And within the very Godhead itself is community, this mutual sharing with each other. And you demonstrate that for us, and then you call us into it. Would you empower us by the faith that we have in the Lord Jesus to come into the space of doing this for your honor and for our benefit. This is good for us when we do this. 
And so, Lord, bless us now, guide us now, as we are this church that is a humble little church, but we are honoring, honoring you with what we say and do, and we lit, wish to live in Christian community with each other. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.